gentlemen, welcome back to a very special uh, Homeless Romantic podcast today. I've got a very good friend of mine, Sarah McCoy, who Hello. is a musician and wonderful human being, and um, among other things, yes. um, she's living in France, uh, not too far from me. How you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. Spicy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling <really> spicy. <laughs> so we were just talking about something really cool. There was a... a philosopher name what was his Aristoc- name? Aristoc- oh god Aristoc- now you're gonna be Her- no it's Aristophocles. Aristophocles, if people I'm not mistaken. look him up and you'll figure it out but so what did he do T- tell so me appar- okay so Give the whole me. thing about him and this is a reduction this is like the reader's digest version of a podcast that i was listening to philosophize this that told the story of Aristophocles, the most notoriously grouchy philosopher that insults Basically, anybody that tries to compliment him, working in the metaphysical world, who is well known for, uh, you can never step in the same river twice. You know, notably that not every scene stays the same. You know, that water is actually moving. You can't put your foot in the same water. Anyway, that was him that was like, ooh, what we think is obvious. You know, Isaac Newton got hit in the head with an apple and gets all this fucking credit where I can fall out of my bed and not get nothing. (laughs) Anyway. Uh, so he has this, uh, he gets this disease that makes his body retain water like crazy and him being into the metaphysical shit, this is turning into drunk history really (laughs) quick. I'm just hearing my tongue rolling around in my mouth like this. Anyway, so he's in, I swear the story ends soon and it's great. Um, so he being into metaphysical shit gets this disease where he's swelling so much and he thinks okay well cow shit when you get it wet rehydrates so uh, hypothetically if i cover myself in cow shit it's going to draw out all of this extra water in my body and so he gets into this pile of cow shit up to his chin and fucking dies in it (laughs) that's just how he fucking dies buried in shit Grouchiest philosopher ever can't step in the same river twice, but you can step in the same cow shit plenty of times. Plenty. I'm sorry. Dying in it. Best opening story ever. You are welcome. And I'm so sorry for all the misinformation. No. Yeah, that's that hearsay, the, that right? The, well, that's the kind of shit that people want to know, you know? <laughs> we gotta! I almost wrecked my bike hearing that story. I was like, God damn, if I'm not Heracles, I'm gonna die in my shit. It's like, you know, is that the hill you're gonna die on? No, that's the cow, pile of cow shit I'm gonna die in. <laughs> fecal matter. That's what that is. Fecal matter has limited medical applications, turns out. <laughs> <laughs> As it turns out. I think the people that, like, eat it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, Why? Uh, gives him power, you know. There was a guy oh. that we used to go around naked and drink his own urine because he believed that clothes were uh, like uh, uh, an invention of the system and it was keeping you from uh, getting the ingredients you needed to survive. And uh, so he would walk around right naked and drink it. And like it, drinking his own pee, saying, I don't waste any of my, you know, energy. He runs it through twice just to be sure. I'm pretty sure it kills you after the third time, right? There's, like, nothing left in it that you can use. You'd just be peeing salt cubes at some point. Yeah, that's seriously, like, it's, it's bouillon. <laughs> bouillon. Oh, man. If we were talking poop, that would be a perfect play on words, because bouillon, <laughs> whatever. It's like passing a, passing a kidney stone that smells like chicken noodle soup. Ah, uh, can you imagine? Wow. <laughs> just wow Heracles we've come to join you <laughs> or Heris- I think it's Heracles oh god Heracles I don't that know makes anyone. more sense yeah uh, I want. I just want to put more Aristocleses in everything that I think is Greek in philosophy Aristocles not Aristocles yeah it's yes, like Aristocleses or you know what I mean <laughs> I haven't been to Greece yet. I want to go to Greece, but I haven't. I, I can't. Yo, is, is it good? I want to go so fucking bad because that whole blue white thing. Right. It's so pretty. Right. It's so pretty. I also have a few friends that live on a boat. It's like a polyamorous thruple uh, nice. that lives on a boat with their three cats. They are amazing. Um, Shout out. Yeah, shout out. Oh, my God. I forgot. Sailing Wake. They have this, like, boat, and you can follow them on Instagram and stuff. Uh, But, yeah, they they island hop outside of Greece, and their whole fucking life is just gorgeous. I know it's struggle. You can't live on a boat without struggling. That shit's work. 
uh, to live is a struggle, but to do it is in grief. If the struggle is that beautiful, struggle, you know, fuck. Struggle. When I hear the word struggle, I think of somebody wrestling around inside of a sleeping bag. It's a, it's a struggle. That is a really accurate image of struggle. I don't know what the word itself makes me think of somebody stuck in a sleeping bag trying to get out. Well, now that you've said it, it's like, yeah, that's all I think about, too. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. Something bound and wiggling. Yeah, the double G's maybe puts wiggle and struggle together. Or so maybe maybe it. because it's like snuggle. Snuggle and struggle. I was struggle. thinking that, too, but no. <laughs> Ain't it's... nothing snuggly about struggling. <laughs> I fucking love that you're here. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. This is so, nice to. You, so for real, you've been like reading a lot of like and hearing a lot of podcasts about true crime. Yes. What are some of the more bizarre crimes that you've heard about? Ooh, on the true crime podcast. Well. <sighs> or in real crime. life. Well, I mean, like. Is this the time that I can, like, bring up my, my family murder story? <laughs> oh, my God. You have a family murder story? Well, okay. So it could be Irish lore. Or I could owe someone in New York, like, and their entire family drinks or something. <laughs> if there's someone out there who's got a family member who was beamed to death by a flying piece of meat, I'm your girl. <laughs> okay, so here's the deal. According to my mother, uh, this is like back in the early 19, like, mm, I want to say early 1900s. It's got to be before my dad was born, which was 1929. So we're talking down there. And uh, we're talking, it's New York City, early 1900s. And my grandfather was a police officer. And I, what the story is, is that he went to the, the butcher and the butcher gave him a piece of meat. I think it was a bribe because we're talking it's like the early 1900s. So I'm going to say he takes this bribe meat to the local like apartment building. And back then you could really go into like, you know, the unlocked furnace room because they didn't know serial killers like take people down to the unlocked furnace room. And people, <laughs> anyway, uh, so but this is the thing. My dad used to tell me stories that he as a kid, they would used to go open all the dumbwaiters in the hallway because that you know dumb waiter it's like the thing that you can bring stuff up that yeah, went yeah. all the way down to the furnace room and so they would open all the dumb waiters in the hallway up open the one in the furnace room and then go down and piss on the ashes and then the whole building would smell like piss and it was like god damn those mccoy irish motherfuckers ah oh! you know whatever so that's the, you know just kind of giving you the picture of like what this was like in his day and era but um so my grandfather goes down there and i guess there was like a piece of metal he could have put the meat on the inside and just kind of cooked it so he puts the the meat inside the furnace on this little thing of metal closes it and goes for a little turn lets it cooks and comes back but when he comes back and he opens it the meat is gone and he's like did it fall to oblivion below? Did so, who the fuck's going to steal my meat? You know what I mean? Uh, so very shortly, he was summoned to a scene on the road uh, where a man was dead. And when he went to go check out the scene on the road, there was a dead man on the street with a piece of meat next to his head. And so I'm smiling because I'm like, is this true? Is this Irish lore? Did my fucking grandfather do this? So what he realized was that it was his piece of meat. And um, the theory as to what had happened was that when he opened the furnace, it had created a vacuum strong enough to suck the piece of meat out of the top of the chimney and rain it down on a to an unsuspecting pedestrian, killing him. <laughs> um, so not only was it his piece of meat that went mystery, he knew the murder mystery from beginning to end because he's like, wait, that's my steak. Why would this guy have been, oh, and it's just... <laughs> so yeah, and he got to respond wow. to his own crime, which means the cover-up was easy, I guess. <laughs> I'm laughing, but I'm like, oh, police <laughs> officer, grandfather. Of course, he got away with crime. Well, like, everybody—they're uh, they're, all—they're all, you know, that's a long time ago. That's 
a long time ago. So there's no newspapers that I can like look at to prove that this is a real story. But it was one of those things where my mom, I was like making something in the kitchen. She's like, did I ever tell you the story about when your grandfather killed somebody? I was like, excuse me, why? Yeah. Well. So maybe. I mean, it's a hell of a way to go. It's, I mean. Hit by a flying piece of meat. Let's hope he wasn't like, you know, on his way to cash a big check at the bank. (laughs) God, just won the lottery. Oh, God. Or he's like, I'm going to go buy my fiance her wedding ring. (laughs) Bean. And not only bean, but like, what? A piece of meat. You know, the family's just left like, you know, this Henry was beaten to death by a piece of steak. I can at least say that it is indirect. It's like, it's not like he had a. Intentionally. Like a gun that shot steaks and like, was like, put him up and then blasted him. I fucking wish that was the story. (laughs) I really do. I wish that was the story. God damn it. One of my other favorite crimes. I hate, you know, favorite crime is a hard thing to say because crime is so rough. <clears throat> Certain crimes are okay. Like if you get into like uh, bank robbing and stuff like that. That For me, that's just wonderful. If nobody gets hurt, they go in there, they get the money, they try to... That's a great story. But then you've got peep serial killers. Like we were talking... John Wayne mm. Gacy. This guy mm. was nuts. Dick. But I like Ted Bundy. He was almost scarier because of how smooth talking he was. One time, that's the narcissist, man. Dude, my those aunt, guys. My aunt was a. Um, she was an operator for uh, Pacific Bell or whatever it was in those days, and she would patch people through. Well, he, she got to talk to him on the phone and for like a, a hot minute, and she was like, he sounded very nice. She, he was getting patched through to his lawyer or something of like that. Of course he sounded really nice, man. He was... Ted Bundy. You know, some people can just like... I, you know, a lot of times I think it's about the masks we wear. Mm-hmm. I say this a lot, but... You know, those guys know how to wear a mask until a certain point, and then it always falls. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And then they... as As if they can gaslight everybody into believing that it never fell in the first place. They just pick it up and wear it again. Yeah. Whoever buys it. Well, that's, that's, that's an interesting thing because there's a whole industry built for politicians to, to keep put, you know, put the best foot forward and hide the other one. And then, then the shit comes out. Oh, he was molesting kids or he was, you know, diddling his secretary or whatever. And then they turn around. Who cares? Diddle those secretaries if it's consensual. Right. We have to stop, you know. I'm sorry. I was in a no, very you're, you're absolutely, interruption. Absolutely right. But this is the kind of thing where yeah. It happens all the you time. You find out that they're human because they well, can't be morally superior like they're pretending to be. Nobody's fucking yeah. morally superior. We can do things right and wrong, man. Yeah. Best foot forward. Everybody's trying to put their best foot forward. I mean, shit. Look at fucking social media. Yeah, yeah. Everything is just like my best face. I have a one hour unedited face to face conversation with people. Not not like what you have crafted via email th- with a draft being like, oh, that'll be that'll play good. No, it's just you wearing yourself on your sleeve. We're just chatting and then bada bing, bada boom. Not bam. But yeah. This is the age we live in. Yeah. That's like, uh, speaking of crime, uh, there's the documentary about what Scott Peterson. Who's you know that? what I'm talking about? No, wait, that's the Lacey Peterson one. Who am I fucking thinking of? Oh, Shan- Shanann O'Connor. Sinead O'Connor? The Irish uh, pop star? Oh, God. Oh, my God. Please don't publish me failing on this. I think <laughs> Shanann what? Shanann Waits. I think is is her. Oh God! I should really stop guessing because that is very rude to the victim. But no, it was a dude out in California <laughs> who killed his wife and children. Uh, she was pregnant with a baby, and then like uh, he he put the two girls' bodies in an oil tank. Oh, yeah. And just buried. You know who I'm talking about? And like her best friend called the cops right away. So the cops came over, and he pretends and tries to like walk them through the whole fucking house. It's it's absolutely just fucking nuts, man. <laughs> it's, it's not funny. And he just 
No, of course it's not funny, but it's so funny how dumb he is to get caught right away in the, the, the hubris to even try in the first place. I mean, whatever. I, I like kind of forgot why I brought it but, up. But you, like you said, everybody wants to get away with it, even though the murder, you, you murder somebody, and that happens because the instinct to kill is there. But then you got to get rid of that body. And I've heard all kinds of stuff, like you pour concrete or you feed them to hogs. and The hogs one is so obvious. That hog farmer in Canada, who was the serial killer hog farmer in Canada, who like killed so many fucking sex workers. He killed so many women. It was like a disgusting thing that they found at that place and just scattered their bones everywhere. They were picking women's bones out of his ground for forever. It was crazy. And he was a creepy, creepy, creepy looking dude, pig farmer. Ooh. Super, one of those friendly guys, you know, that goes to the state fair, pig farmer. <laughs> So there's a true crime for every subject. Yeah. I'm sorry. I have to dial it the fuck back. I'm no, but off. we but we should throw shade on everybody. We're going to throw shade on the pig farmers. We're going to throw shade on the, the uh, circus clowns like John Wayne Gacy. Dude. Who else can we throw shade on? I mean, we could throw shit on, well, whatever that guy's name was, if I could remember the fucking name of the, the murder series, it's terrible. <laughs> it's, I feel it terrible. I Well, I came to this conversation clearly unprepared to have it. That's um, what makes it great. Watts. Shanann Watts. Okay. That was her name. Uh, and I'm sorry, I have to make this right with this you, Christopher you... Watts. You look it up. Bitch ass motherfucker. Yeah, I have to look it up. Well, I'll tell a story while you do that. And for for all the people out there that don't know, Charles Manson was officially called the worst serial killer in history and he's considered the king and everything. But Charles Manson never actually killed anybody. No. But it was set a precedent for charging people for manipulating and, you know, brainwashing other people into killing. But uh, I think just the fact that he was considered a serial killer is not really true. I think it's a bit dishonest. Not to say that he wasn't a crazy, criminal, violent kind of person, whatever. Piece of shit. Piece of yeah. shit. Total piece of <laughs> dog shit. That, sure, that's fine. But he didn't kill those people. And the, and the lawyer that wrote the book... Um, who was the defense lawyer? Or like the he he was the one that went after him in court. I don't forget what you call that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. A prosecutor. Yeah, thank you, honey. <laughs> yeah, I'm having a good, I'm having Take a great it, time. See, I was like a prosecutor. Um, <laughs> he wrote a book. This guy Bugliosi. He wrote a book and basically made all these really wild assumptions about how Beatles songs had some kind of secret reference and language no. to what the I never it was got bullshit. that it was bullshit yeah it you was know. ridiculous it was a stretch a to say the least wicked stretch and they bought it ding dongs yeah Fucking... sorry Please yeah can... well crime yeah. I'm just I'm just I get I get a little twitter pated talking about crime a twitter pated <laughs> I get a little what, is that like constipated on twitter yeah <laughs> Is Twitter painted a word? Am I missing it? It was. It used to be before. I did not know. Before the internet came. Let me. Okay, now I'll look it up. For everybody out there look, re, enjoying this. The word Twitter painted. Yeah, sure. To in, infatuated or obsessed. Holy shit! In a state or what? in a state of nervous excitement. That puts Twitter in kind of like a new. The word Twitter painted. Uh, they probably thought that from the beginning. All those smarty pantses out there with their fancy algorithms and their laptops. Yeah, they're out in California. 5G. God, there really are people out there that are just like kids like this now. Everything is <laughs> what was, oh, whatever the new slang word is. I'm too fucking old to know. Dude, I'm always kind of yeah. We're yeah. Getting, we don't, let's not tell people how old we are. We're actually very oh, no. hip and we're very young. And very we, young. Yeah. So young. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm so happy to say I don't feel young anymore. Like there's still youth left in me. There's still life left in me. But this, I think there's like a certain naivety who has a flown the coop. And I feel more confident being a dick about my limits and shit like that. Or... 
you know, step, yeah. step the fuck. And I think that was, that's the nice part about not being young. Cause yeah, you know, you're always so eager to please people when you're young. Yeah. yeah. A lot of us, you know, in entertainment or yeah. otherwise, you know, you need some way to validate your existence. And for a lot of people, hopefully you get over that. Validation? I don't think we ever get over validation, man. I don't know. I don't think I'd, I definitely wouldn't. I'm still, I'm 36. I'm not over validation. I still get some kind of morbid thrill out of speaking with people and making them laugh and getting, oh, the, yeah. you know, so I don't know if that's, and I, I'm not like everybody else. Like if I go to the grocery store, the people there, they love me. And I, and so it's not normal. Like here, especially, people don't go around going and be in the life of the party. And now the people at the grocery store, when they see me coming, they go, hey! I love that. I think every, here's the deal, I think every old person loves that. My mom is a huge ham for grocery store connections. Where did my computer get to? Well, I old mean, people love that. that but that's what we, we, we need that. I love that for you. It's a validation. It's a good validation of your existence. When you start to live without it, it actually hurts because yep. you're like, I've got no context for this soul and this body. Why does I? Need, why do I need it if it's not validated? You well, know? well, the one thing I do need is to check uh, things that are happening in my life. What you, humans have to do is run it by the people that they know. Run it by your community. Hey, I've got mm. something wrong with my brain i get headaches all the time or whatever i say my wife is cheating on me or whatever you go to your community and you get some kind of support about this no matter how old you are i think it's mm. the the source of longevity and like uh and like i've been isolated now and it's a bit like living in antarctica yeah huh yeah you know what it's like you've been living in france away from america for how long now uh five years in october long that's a long time. It's a long while. But you know, it's weird. It, there's, it's, when we say those two years don't count, we're all like, oh, everybody's saying it. But like, it's always going to feel like those two years didn't count. I'm like, okay, I've been gone for five years, but like, there was two of it where it was like, Beep. not much work got done. I wasn't allowed to go home. It was kind of just frozen. Yeah. yeah. I got a little older. <laughs> yeah. Lived, lived yeah. about 10 lifetimes in one year. I had so many psychic deaths. There were pieces of me that just like, and they were needed to go, but they just. Yeah, yeah. Maybe COVID's what made me feel older. I don't know. How did you feel about it in like another country and stuff like that? During that time, I mean, of course, yeah. stuck, but hyper focused on uh, the world we live in. Everybody was forced to look directly at this. Uh, developing scene. Well, how many dead and how many? Yeah. yeah. I think we are all glued to it at some point. Oh, yeah. Somebody said that we're all looking at, deep in our hearts for the end of the world, you know. That's kind of accurate and also anti. Well, I, I agree with it because it was just like, okay, this is it. You know, I got like super like people are going to fucking start storming grocery stores and shit like that. You know, <laughs> did happen. Thank God. But like kind of, but a little, a little bit. There was this point and I'll never forget it. Because I lived on like the third floor of this apartment building, and around where I lived, so many of those places are like vacation rentals. All the windows were fucking black, and just like in confinement in this space, there were windows that were lit up, and those people kept me like alive, even if they were just shadows, you know. <clears throat> but uh, when it all first started, I had this like sun pop open sunroof right above my bed, and there was like a series of three days the first three days like a week in a confinement after like you know a weekend where it's just like oh this is real it was super fucking windy like i'm sorry this is a long story maybe i'm going on this is a it's a podcast. <laughs> so it was like super fucking windy and that hurt it made the reality of it much colder it was winter it was windy and at like three or four in the evening my little sunroof thing started kind of rattling a little bit and there was this like pounding sound the whole roof had this pounding sound but i woke from a dead sleep thinking that covid was over they had found somehow i'm so delusional right but like that somehow in a week they had found a solution and we were all going to be okay and that people heard it in the middle of the night and that people were like in the streets partying and i woke up to thinking that 
and then taking just a couple of moments of blinking off sleep and realizing that it was just really hard, cold wind beating at my roof. And that was one of the most empty feelings I have ever had in my life. Yeah. yeah. I'm so glad, right? Like, that's some dark shit. I was like, we're all going to go back to normal now, right? And it was the denial was over. You know, in this moment, it was like, nope, that is the cold, beating wind of death at the door. And it was. <laughs> it was, anyway, that's, it was just fucking that was hard yeah. <laughs> that whole like beginning period was hard i drank so hard through it right. you know moderately hard to very hard but like you know one bottle of prosecco a day is going to catch up to me in my 70s <laughs> I had... God, don't save me send me home I mean, I had a similar experience. I mean, you 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 hear about all this stuff, but I had when I started working out and eat and buy. I bought up all the beans a few weeks before everybody else kind of raided the store. I was two weeks that American, early. That American trauma. We know. We yeah. know. We know. know. I knew it was coming, and I just thought, wait, I'll better be sure. The Euro get the beans. The Europeans were laid, more laid back about it, but then again, it never like there was never a huge run on things. Here there was, for sure. Toilet paper for like two, three weeks. There was no DP. That was that was about it. But I wasn't that afraid. Was the first thing I did, I was like, I'm an American. I have been in a hurricane. I know exactly what the <laughs> fuck I'm getting. And I'm going to get double that. And nobody, it was like right when I first started popping it up in the news, I was like, it's time to get the toilet paper. <laughs> it's fun. You know what I mean? My friend, my French friend, got mad at me. He was like, "This is why we will run out of toilet paper because you all buy it all at the same time." But I was right, and he didn't have toilet paper. Fucking dirty ass motherfucker. <laughs> anyway, I his never had to get it for a while. I love that French accent. Yeah, he actually didn't sound like that at all. He sounded more German. It was weird. Really? His French accent was German. <laughs> Yo, speaking of like. Um, supply and demand kind of shit are you getting any kind of weird like backlash in germany from this ukraine shit from the ukraine shit well look the price of everything is going through the roof what do you want Woo. yeah i noticed that recently that was uh so <clears throat> in paris so my friend couldn't get toilet paper just bouncing back to that story really quick his neighborhood even when paris was loaded with toilet paper it still was out so what they do is they kind of focus the resources to the you know obviously the most concentrated people so in this moment right now in my neighborhoods and the neighborhoods on the outside of paris you cannot find flour and you cannot find oil no shit you can find it in the middle of Paris, but you cannot find it in my neighborhood. It is there's like maybe two drops left on the shelf, and they're going to sell in two days when everybody else runs out. Uh oh, so I should be looking, huh? I should be looking out. Just be careful because, like, you know, I feel like it's very weird to see that here because we have so much sunflower fields and shit like the colza and the sunflower fields that's the middle of france so it feels to me like there should be backup somewhere mm -hmm. but i don't you know what i mean so much of that shit wheat especially that's coming from ukraine we're blocked and this is the land of bread man mm -hmm. like i went to this was two weeks ago i went to this lebanese restaurant and he's like yeah we can't get them to ship us oil <laughs> he's like we can't get oil we can't get flour he's like this is what we're gonna we gotta change it up a little bit like, okay well, I, I'm going to check up on that. I'm going to see what's going on in my neighborhood. Just keep an eye, man. If you see that flower starting to dip and not popping back up, careful now. Careful now. Better get that. Better go, go get some bulk flower somewhere. Well, I live without flour, but that's, I, you know, I try. I'm always on a diet that never works. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, so I, but the oil thing is a big one. That's a, You can't live without oil, so. I mean, you could do butter for a while, but you can't make salad dressing with butter. I mm. mean, maybe I'll learn how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but... Just to eat butter all the time. Ah, oh, bro, don't tempt me. It's my favorite fucking thing, yo. They have this fucking butter here with these big salt chunks in it. Oh, God, yes. I know this. Oh, I can't eat that shit. Yo, I get those, like, rice crackers. You know, those, like, like flat, crispy ones? Yes. And I put the salt butter on it, and it's just a little beep bop <laughs> of honey. That shit will rock your 
fucking soul. It's so good. I know, but it's not good for you. You know what I did? I would do, when I'm hungover, I'd take salted butter and just eat an entire baguette and just put like a whole stick of butter inside of a baguette and just eat that. And it works. This is painful. I'm so high right now. <laughs> like, oh, ah, I won't put on a baguette. That's going to be great. <laughs> we, we should go get some fucking tacos, man. I miss tacos. I look. I went to what was it? Madrid. I went to Madrid and they had a fucking Taco Bell in Madrid. Really? And I was yes. And I was like, I want to get Taco Bell so <laughs> fucking bad. But it was like this forbidden thing. You cannot have two days in Madrid and go to Taco Bell. You know what I mean? I almost wanted to do it in secret because I was like, give me that fucking chalupa. I want that fucking hot sauce. I want pockets of hot sauce. <laughs> The Homeless Romantic yes. Podcast brought to you by Taco Bell. Oh no! What I want to say that shit. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Yo, what? Fuck you, Taco Bell. Sponsor my shit. Buy us equipment. Gotta go. <laughs> Taco Bell is highly addictive, delicious, bad for you bullshit food. Oh, and we hate you. International. I love you. I would. I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love you. Don't listen to him. <laughs> That's the only one to talk about. I knew okay. it. I knew it. I am. Look, you don't get a double chin not loving one fast food restaurant. I grew up in a fast food restaurant. I survived Did you? off of I, my my parents owned a really off brand fast food restaurant. Really? See if you can name it. They serve things like ice cream and hot dogs. What? Oh, not Whataburger. Uh, no. It was the A and W. Close. That was one of the competitors. Steaks and shakes? No. <laughs> not the steaks. Clearly not hot dogs. Shake and steak. No. Shake and steak. No, okay, no. steaks and shakes. No, it's di- <laughs> it had big red logo. Ryan's? No. I loved Ryan's. I said this is great that I love this game. <laughs> um, let's see. They had like the dipped ice cream cones, banana splits. Uh, no, Dairy Queen. Yeah. I loved that game. Let's do another. (laughs) That was was the most fun guessing game ever. I love that. All right. So your parents owned a Dairy Queen. Yeah. 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 Casey. So I know all the ins and outs of the the DQ business. I've been to the conventions. I have. I know how much a peanut butter parfait weighs. It weighs 11 and a half ounces. Still? And whipped cream. uh, Maybe. I don't know. Whipped cream. Inflation, you know. Yeah, the war. The war is on. <laughs> Sorry, it's not funny. I'm like, the war. <laughs> no, yeah, war is, okay, war is bad. Okay, guys out there listening? War is bad. War is bad. I don't want to be the person that does this, but I'm going to be the person that does this because it's uh, like I keep seeing all this like Ukrainian, we support Ukraine, and I'm 100% with it. I can also say I'm allowed to feel this way. I feel so bad for Afghani refugees. You know what I mean? That there's so many Afghani refugees in Paris and like no one said a word. There was like the news flashes of brown people leaving, you know, Afghanistan and shit like that when it got taken over by the Taliban, but there was no fucking we stand with, you know, Afghanistan. It was just like this, okay, brown people are coming thing. And I was like, you know what it must feel like to have to go through Turkey like that? I mean, they got to come. Boof, boof. It's, I mean, I'm not saying any refugee's trajectory is fucking easy. But what they do to get here, I mean, it's... It's unbelievable. It hurts to see that it's, uh, it just hurts, you know, because it's like you want support, but support starts to feel fake when it doesn't take on inclusivity you know it's you, painful you, you have to be an individual when it comes to helping people a local community or to do that i i live next to a guy from iraq he didn't speak german he didn't speak english he lived above us and he had a kid we came home one time he was burning all this like ikea furniture that had a bunch of lacquer on it so he could barbecue oh, Jesus. barbecue and hot dogs with it yeah. and eating this stuff i was like they're just you can't do that. They they just were fresh, fresh, yeah. freshly there. And then he needed yeah. he needed to move, and I helped him move and stuff. And we made like several trips and stuff. And we never, 
uh, understood a word each other said, and we went up to his apartment one time and had lunch and tea, and they served cookies, and um, and he was our age and stuff. But it was, oh. uh, I you know, I got roped into it because I like they're great, they're friendly, they're here to, and and then I had a, the neighbor that lived right next to him was a racist like a big fat kind of nazi german girl it was like Fuck oh me. my god so it takes all types and this i'm okay with everybody but if everybody could just fucking get along for crying out loud the war thing is just like well, i just you know we were talking about earlier this n- need you know is murder a, a need or something like this and that's why we get obsessed with like serial killers and stuff like that because you're like oh well you know like there's this taboo thing about it we're drawn to yeah then you get to things like war and i never find it fascinating for any of the same reasons there's it just i mean war is fascinating but and it's how huge it is but to want to do that to that many people yeah well, these are two different. That's sad. They, these are anyone. Two, well, these are two different groups of people. You have the people up on top who decide to wage the wars and strategize about it, and then it goes all the way down to the the lower people who only follow directions, and that's the dangerous mm-hmm. part. Like the people on top yeah. know what they're doing, oh, but the yeah. people on bottom don't really understand why they're going to war and have to find out later when they're in a wheelchair trying to get their check from the VA hospital. I wouldn't have understood at 18. I mean, fuck. Thanks, Mom. Also, by the way, thanks, Mom. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. No, it's... But it brings up, like I should, you know, like the the reason like people can even be convinced to go to war is is one of the things that fascinates me. Just following directions blindly, you know. Like I, I, I was talking to you before about the Milgram experiment where they would put people in a room and see how far they would go if under, yeah. say, somebody over your shoulder barking orders saying, just do it, just do it, just do it. Yeah. How far you'll actually go. Well, it turns out a big, a large majority of the population is capable of car- compartmentalized thinking where they can only accept things from a hierarchy source or absorbed the opinions of their peers and stuff mm. and make decisions based on that. And that's just totally interesting and bizarre. Well, I think there's a psychology of just pressure in general. When you're told a system of power is in place, whether it's real or not, which it's not. <laughs> Fuck those guys. <laughs> I mean, they're real. They're so scary. <laughs> Fuck them. It's not real. That's, you know, we language isn't even a certain thing. We fall so short with language. So what gives us the audacity to believe that our idealistic structures don't fall short of their fucking purpose. You know what I mean? Like, so uh, whatever it's, of course, it's just imaginary. We imagined it into existence and it's failing just like language. But anyway, but it's fun to believe in it. I apparently, I mean, I get, I get the whole, look, I buy into examining moral and stuff like that. Again, I was like listening to this podcast about philosophy, philosophize this. The guy's fucking awesome. I love this shit. And he was like kind of digging into Simone de Beauvoir, which I live on Simone de Beauvoir Avenue. So she was like this feminist uh, philosopher, fa- famous French feminist, fo- feminist philosopher. And I live on her street and she started appearing in this podcast. I'm like, okay, so who are you? And one of the things is, you know, she addresses so many things like what you're talking about, what types of people are the follower, the one that sets up the system and blah, 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 blah. You know, there are types of people. You know, when you look at a society, there's the followers and the na 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 na. Uh, but one of the things she was talking about was like justice, you know, and like the whole idea of like revenge and justice and stuff like that. And after kind of listening to it, which I can't really outline intelligently, I'm sorry, but like uh, in I a came nutshell. to this thing, in a nutshell, I came to this question like, what is justice but revenge? You know, and is that something that we're okay with? And does that, you know, when you apply that idea to war, 
that was a very long way to get to this wow. idea. But I like that though. That's a hell of an idea, because you know, ultimately, do, does it do any good to get to to get that? Because it is. I think it is. I think it is revenge. Does it yeah, do anything course. for you? And do those people? But ever, we justify it as calling it justice. Do, they do, get what they deserve. Would those people be rehabilitated or change their ways? Not necessarily, but sometimes they do, if you give them a chance to. But um, I'm like, like people are just fucking meat. If you want to treat a, a, a pig or a squirrel like a piece of shit that you can just throw into a wood chipper, then why not a human being? <laughs> so, so let's take the bad ones and just toss them, toss them out. But. That gets really fascist, though. I know. I, who gets to define that? And obviously, it would be the people of power, and that's literally what the Holocaust was. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. that's so funny, but that's literally what... Yeah, but, it's but it's I, funny because that feels like the solution, but someone tried that, and it clearly was not the solution, you know? Dang it. Dang! Like the French Revolution, where they started chopping off uh, 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 rich people's heads. I thought, that's cool. That's, that sounds like a cool thing. <laughs> the Algerians came for the French, too. That's a pretty good one. You know, the French-Algerian War. We know, yeah. we know nothing about this shit because they don't teach it to us in school, but, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean. They don't want to, for obvious reasons. And also, China. they don't tell you about China. They don't tell you about China. They actually also execute, uh, like, billionaires and, like, High end, high elite businessmen who break the law, they fucking kill them, which is awesome. I gotta give it props. Could you to imagine China. being held to such a high moral standard because you have money? I can't be held to that kind of moral standard as what I am now, let alone what I would do with money. Not to say I would do bad things, but like my God. Yeah, yeah. You know, well, that's, that's fucking heavy. Well, here, dig this. is like, that's the reason why the, we have the society we do is because we say, uh, and the people on the bottom especially, they look at the people on the top and they make the assumption that the money that they have is indicative. It's because of how great they are as a person or the, the value that they add to society, which is or, usually not true. Most wealth is inherited, you know. But these people on the bottom believe that the people on top must have got there because they're awesome, and that's the end of the story. And so we should probably just listen to whatever they say. And the fucking police are the gatekeepers to the whole operation, busting your head open when you disagree. This is just 100%. like a rough sketch of what I'm seeing in my... Yeah. You know? I mean, like, the control is... Well, and, you know, that's there's... The gatekeepers of the information too you know think of all the things like when i was saying about the the french algerian war you that happened in the 70s and that was algeria ejecting the colonists the french colonists and it was fucking violent hmm. they were not playing and uh like french people who were born in algeria had to come back to france like they couldn't stay they had to go um and I think that if they taught that kind of shit in the American school system, do you know how empowered that would make Native Americans and African Americans? You know what I mean? They can't hear of someone taking back what's theirs on their own turf. So they don't teach it. I was like, I didn't even hear about that shit until I was in my 30s. So there's the control of the information. You know what I mean? Selective this... education. Oh, my God. If we think that we're so fucking like oh, whatever, I'm just I can't follow the. Well, yeah, well that's the American exceptionalism that we were told to believe when people used to. I don't know if they still do. Would stand up in class and put your hand on your heart and say some cryptic indoctrination, some creepy uh, kind of the pledge of allegiance. I pledge. Well, like it married so easily with religion because that's how we act with religion. Our oh, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You know, what was it? Uh, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Does that not sound like the same rhythm to you? Same rhythm, same cadence. Listen to that shit. And we, we get still indoctrinated now, but it's different because we always have this fanatical part of our brain that we need to uh, do these kind of superstitious, kind of traditional, kind of ceremonial kind of things. 
And, uh, I'm not gonna lie, I like the pageantry sometimes. I got my little altar in my house and shit. Like wow, well, music and culture is nothing but but that, you know. Pageantry. That literally defines pageantry. What do you do in a pageant? Music and theater, you know. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> even dude, even church music is fucking rad, you know, if you go to the right church. I mean, even some of that old stuff, I know my church was pretty bad music growing up, but even some of that ha 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 ha, you know, <laughs> <laughs> if it's sung by the right choir in the right halls. Yo, I was in this, what was the name of this fucking city? Oh, I always wanted to go back there. I'm too stoned to remember it. Where then was I, it? In America? It like in this, it, no, it was in France. It was this little place that began with an N. It was a tiny ass little town. Fuck, I'll never remember the name of it without looking it up. But uh, you, we had to take a train and then drive an hour to get there. And it was one of like King Louis properties or some shit like that. And I walked into a cathedral. It was beautiful, just a little tiny fucking French town. And I think it's so cute. You're like, you people haven't left. Ah! You know, like it's so cute and beautiful and the gardens and the you know whatever so it was a really nice walk and i get to this beautiful cathedral because every place has this beautiful cathedral and i walked in and the fucking organ dude was practicing phantom of the opera cool. and i was like this is one of the best things fucking ever it was why am i telling you this story i have <laughs> no idea i had to do with like music or something i'm into it though oh music and religion you know what i mean this kid oh, was right. going off the ha ha ha's to do something he'd been waiting right. to do his entire career it's like a da, 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 and i was just like i'm fucking here for this like light, light yeah. a candle see jesus bless this man yeah. it felt really good i was like what and it was like as i was opening the doors da, 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 da. <laughs> i was like da, 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 oh my god this is amazing anyway yeah. I had a but well when I, I I lived in Oakland for a while and we saw I went to I would pass by this church over on the east side of Oakland or whatever rough part of town my my buddy lived outside the house where Huey P Newton the famous founder of the Black Panthers he was shot and murdered outside this house well my buddy lived outside this house so it was a very black neighborhood very cool would go to the 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 Bart station was just a few blocks away but on the way there there would be black church and they would be up there on wednesdays and sundays just rocking out oh my god it was awesome i would just stick my little head in there and it's cool the combination That's rock awesome. and rock and gospel and stuff but i you know god damn. I, I used to grow up in i grew up i did baptist church lutheran churches mormon churches Mormon churches. Mormon churches. Mormon they, music. Mormon music doesn't strike me as something to peep in and listen to. Well, the, the, Mor <laughs> the Mormons, their butt cheeks are so tight that they can't actually sing, you know, with any. I don't know, feeling. man. I heard about I heard about Dawkin. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Does that, how does that work with a butt? <laughs> People should. How does that work with? Dude, people should know that guy that invented that religion was completely full of shit. He was insanely full of oh, shit. Oh, yeah. And a con artist who start, yeah. he started like a bank at one time where he collected people's money. He was like, yeah, we're going to buy some land with the money. It's going to be like a trust and stuff. And he just was like, oh, yep. it's all gone. He was like a total fraud. And I got people in my family that are still hardcore this is what happens when you don't put them in meat grinders or whatever, wood chippers. That's, that's what I'm <laughs> saying. Or yeah. ma march them into the eye of a volcano. Either way. You know what we're talking, you got to be careful. We're treading on sacred grounds here, talking about shredding a religious people. They'll be after us for attempted murder or something or conspiracy oh, to God, brainwash the, the masses. Indecent exposure. That's how, you know, that's cult shit. You know, it's what, there's so many things about whatever, you know. The religious restrictions sometimes get very culty you know it's i'm not to say you, obviously i'm always going to complain about like the restriction of food but if like <laughs> <laughs> cults are happening you know like they make people very very tired and then they only make them eat like at certain hours and make them very hungry and i feel like there's periods in every religion where they do that to you and it's like you trauma bond with your religion 
Yeah, I mean, everybody wants to be like hazed in some way where they feel like they've gone through the the punishment enough Rites to be. Rites of passage are the early hazing. That's hazing. You is know? it almost any culture, native, ancient, whatever, have had some kind of hazing ritual where the young have to do some kind of crazy thing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so what? What do you think? What was your ritual that like for modern just... day people like me? What was the ritual? The ritual was to you know, be able to smoke a joint and get some hair on your nuts and then get in a fight and get in a fight. Kiss Interesting. a kiss a girl and have a uh well, all the other kids, but then at some point I was like, my life is not going the same direction as everybody else's. I'm not gonna get a car when I'm sixteen. I'm not gonna have my you know I was just a poor piece of white trash. Uh hmm. but uh for the most part and then like really consumerist shit. Which is the modern day equivalent to like your rites of passage is this is what concerts I go to, what CDs I have, what sh what stores did I shop at at the mall? Yeah, that became that means nothing. No. That's stolen. That's sto those feel like stolen rites of passage. Abercrombie and Fitch is a stolen rite of passage. <laughs> yeah. I feel like the, then the rites of passage didn't happen later till I took acid and like uh, actually got yeah. into some legal trouble or you know. Yeah, I guess those are kind of rites of passage into a adulthood too. Have you taken LSD? Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> I actually just ate some recently in Germany, and it was fucking. It was one of the best nights of. Oh man! So my, I should probably. I got my headphones on. My doors open. I never know who speaks English. So my, my we'll say friend, not colleague. Well, let's say my colleague. Uh, had a pocket full of drugs at this fucking famous piano player's birthday party. I'm just gonna leave names out of it. That's for... probably good. Yeah. And there were all these beautiful piano players that were there. And at a certain point in the night when all the DJ music stopped and I was still tripping my dick off, I got to sit in front of this grand piano and listen to these concert pianists, like fucking really mastered the touch of the piano just sit down and play and on lsd my dude it was one of the most beautiful things i had just tears streaming <laughs> out of my face it was so gorgeous i could see their mute their energy entering the piano dude and i was like holy fuck i mean it was beautiful but i was bawling it was so beautiful Dude, there has to be so much to be said about LSD and if you're music or if you're in tune with music and to get LSD and it's like nothing else. I really, I was just like, duh, starstruck by this shit. I actually got starstruck by somebody just because of how she played the Claire de Lune. And I was like, oh, <laughs> oh it's, like, oh, it's fucking crazy. Yo, can we like, can we take a quick, I don't mean to interrupt your okay. podcast, but can we take a quick pause to pee? Pause. <laughs> so, nice transition into, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, I was just wondering on another topic, uh, what is the deal with uh, your high school? Was it fun in high school? Did you have a good time? Oh, we're going to talk about the whole thing. You're going to start no. to walk into that with the whole full high school experience. Let me tell you, no, I was no. bad. I was great. And I hated every minute of it. No, no, no. But what, uh, what's with this guy? There was a cop in your high school that was a cop. Yeah, so we, yeah, so we're talking about Officer, quote unquote, Daniel Hires. This fucking sack of shit. I'm just gonna start by like, you know, he always used to say weird shit to us in the fucking cafeteria. I got in trouble for something I shouldn't have gotten in trouble for, and I got ISS, which was in school suspension. I should not have gotten it. Just saying, it was like not justified shit. But, uh, excuse me, he was fucking with us. And uh, when he brought me to, like, when I was in transition to the principal's office or vice principal's office, he was like, uh, you just wait till I get you in handcuffs. You can't do anything like shit like this. And I was like, that's, you're, you're making me wildly uncomfortable. I'm telling on you. And of course I did tell on him. And they're like, you're just trying to get out of ISS. And I was like, no, this motherfucker just said weird shit to me. And then I got put in ISS. And in that in the classroom, the lady was really nice. She was like, I don't know why they're sending you children here. And then I was like, this motherfucking cop said some weird ass shit to me in the fuck while I was getting taken in. Nothing. And I was not the only person. I mean, he was dealing with kids all day long. 
and there was always stories about him anyway so he ends up after a couple of years of uh after i graduated i think what happened first is it came to light that he was assaulting the 10 year old girl the daughter of his wife and then he fucking kills them both and he takes off in this red car i think like corvette or some shit and is never seen from again which, by the way, I think there are other allegations of sexual abuse from other women and probably at whatever. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Sure. So he ends up on America's Most Wanted. And uh, I remember being like, I saw this coming. He looks, and you were the one, I'm going to say, you said he looks like a fucking, what, demonic Matt Damon or hillbilly, what did you say he looks yeah, like? Yeah, he looks like a fucking possessed fucking crackhead Matt Damon. Crackhead Matt Damon, dude. Yeah, I mean, this guy. Here, I'll share this with everybody. Makes to puke into my lap. So, he ends up on America's Most Wanted. We were watching it. We got, to, yeah, this motherfucker. Wow, he really does, like, you know, Nazi Matt Damon. Nazi <laughs> oh, Matt Damon. The fuck? Nazi Matt Damon. <laughs> so, like, this motherfucker uh, gets caught in China in, like, so I guess two, it's 2018, and nobody's heard about, like, uh, whether or not he actually was extradited, but he was an English teacher. And <clears throat> one of his students watched America's Most uh, Wanted and was like, that's my teacher, and turned him in in china Fuck yeah good so god knows maybe they made him disappear into chinese jail which like good good for him if that's like what the case was but it's very weird that we can't it's not it's not a visible case anymore but i remember getting like fucking blasted high on our tall couch in our old apartment which was like a couch on top of a desk so you had to like get up there it was great uh and he came on and i was like oh shit y'all that's my fucking high school cop <laughs> What a dick, though. I Jesus mean, like, Christ. yeah, you know, cops was with those guys. Isn't that what you said earlier? Yeah. <laughs> I fucking knew it. I knew What's it. What's with that guy, man? He looked like he fit the role, man. He slid right through that fucking radar. Or that's exactly the kind of people that they like. Yeah, well, I mean, he pl played by the rules. Mr. Good Guy, good, tight cut. Ugh, it was yeah, just, yeah. Ugh. It's disgusting. Anyway, I so, well, I guess he's caught, and I'm really kind of hoping that he didn't get extradited and that China was like, no, he's going to rot here where we do nothing with baby touchers. Well, yeah, hopefully they kill him. They usually just beat him to death in jail, you know? We going for the wood chipper again right now? Damn it. <laughs> Damn We're it! Going for the wood chipper. <laughs> Guilty. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. forgive and forget. I guess we'll let the, get give pedophiles a second chance. I think I heard a survivor's mother once say, "God can forgive them. I don't have to." But what if that that what if he doesn't exist though? That's well, then fine. nobody forgives him, and that's even better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, are you kidding me? <laughs> that's the best. I fucking love revenge. It's my favorite, and I resent that, because this is, I, I, revenge is so great. When you get a good, bah, it's tasty. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's yeah. fucking tasty. Man, those, it's just like Quentin Tarantino films of the revenge porn. It's just wonderful to see people get so, there just... I hate revenge porn. That's like the worst concept. <laughs> I think I'm about to get nailed with revenge porn yeah, someday. But it's deep in you. That's the thing is if you want to see that, people get their justice and it's just a bloodlust. God damn. We're ruthless creatures. Oh, consciousness. Ter terrible. What, what about like you think that with consciousness you get like this better understanding of your own emotions, but in fact it's just more confusing? Yeah. <laughs> what the fuck is that? Like, uh, what? Yeah. Each, each piece of technology that we've created for our monkey selves is like an abstraction that keeps us, it's like a sheet of paper that keeps us uh, uh, like not understanding the real building blocks of life and how we so well, people don't fucking get they don't understand themselves they never will they're gonna try to buy their way into it with did they ever products you know 
if we're here, did we ever understand ourselves? I think there was is a, that is the, the plight of the fool is to understand self. That is actually yeah, pretty much the plight of the fool. Is it to under? I mean, like to understand purpose, of course, is the plight of the fool. But self, I don't know, you know, because that's an ever-changing thing. It's a it's self like searching for yourself is a luxury. And, and 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 animals that live in that kind of luxury should be put out of their misery in a wood chipper in the wood chipper <laughs> my god wow yeah i don't know i think we've hit our peak as far as now all the technology that comes now is just going to be an abstraction that confuses us even more so to who we are and how we work well, that's the AI. There's actually an old philosopher that predicted this shit, which I thought was crazy. This is podcasts, you know. Uh, but there's this whole idea that everything that he, uh, a man creates is kind of an extension. Every tool in life is an extension of one of your senses. Like your headphones are an extension of your ears. Your, your glasses are an extension of your eyes. Your sweater is an extension of your skin. You know, and you're feeling things like this. Everything that we create is an extension of ourselves. Mm -hmm. Music is an extension of your well, voice. It, of your voice, if you're singing, of your fingers, if you're playing piano. You know, it's and that's what's so sublimative about it. And and at the same time, though, there's it's that when we were talking about oversaturation of art, is you know, sublimation. Uh, in danger of being desensitized because it keeps mounting, mounting to this point where it's, you know, everything's just artificial. Mm -hmm. Everything's just an extensive, uh, it's an extension of self. Yeah. Nothing is so. It's a Xerox. Uh, it's, a, it's a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. Yeah. You and there's the new plane of existence that happens after that, after everything is. Right. And so, yeah, and that's why I see it happens in the evolution of music where they take on a style where they don't even understand why they mm. do it. There was this great um, anecdote that somebody Birds. told. Birds. Duh. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. There was this great anecdote that somebody told about how they information got evolved. It was because um, they had this great recipe for a cake that their grandmother had. And they said, okay, well... Uh, my grandmother used to make it. It was great lemon cake in two pans. It had this, that, and the other flour, sugar, in this consistency. And for whatever reason, you got to cook it in two two pans or whatever. And you make enough for two pans. And she thought that it was because of flavor and because of everything. But it turns out that the only reason that the lady did it like that was because the oven at the time was too small. You know, so we we just pick up traditions. And pick up oh. the evolution of traditions for no. Sometimes we lose the the entire meaning of why we oh, take on certain shit. traditions. That was a great example, bro. Oh, thank you. What the fuck? I was shook. <laughs> I love wow. that. I really love that. That's cool. That's a really perfect example of exactly what you mean. Yeah. But, uh, we're funny. People are funny. And the more you know about them, the more that you can at least avoid some of the bad parts of well, what they do. We get so sentimental about tradition and shit like that. And what we know is truth, you know, that we get really, we think the other person is going to dissolve if they don't believe the same thing. There's something about their essence that's, that's like, you're going to die? Go into oblivion? Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. God, I think I think LSD opened up my eyes to certain ways of like behavior just at the moment of talking to somebody and understanding what kind of energy I give them and what kind of energy I receive and stuff and and how yeah. that all plays out and and decide, and then making a conscious choice to either be nice and wonderful or to be a total sack of shit and be aggressive and confrontational it depends it really depends yo, yo dude it's, it's kind of interesting what like uh where you choose the moments to be aggressive because you could keep your shit together all the time but there's just certain moments where you need to project your aggression yeah you know that's for sure that's for sure fucking 
I think for me, it's the people in my neighborhood on my bike path that go by me too fast or don't say hi or, you know, anybody who seems a little narcissistic and in their own world, I just, then I get mad and I start yelling in, in English. That, <laughs> that usually makes me feel uh, bad. I hate the having to yell in your foreign language or your not your yeah, mother for, tongue. Yeah, foreign, yeah. Foreign language, yeah. You're we're uh, both dirty foreigners. Yeah, we're dirty foreigner, man. I feel it. Cuz like it's the it's the I cannot fully ex, exprime to you what I want you to feel, so I have to say it in my mother tongue. <laughs> Fuck you, suck dicks, you donkey licking piece of shit, you know? I Just, got I got cut off by a guy recently in in the north of Germany, and uh, he kept uh, like slamming on his brakes or something, and it got into some thing where I pulled alongside him and I was just screamed at him, "Fuck you!" And he screamed at me back in like broken English. He's like, "Yeah, yeah, fuck you, fuck you!" And <laughs> <laughs> you can't, okay, guy. <laughs> But then I think I can't win if you're that guy. (laughs) It's such a small village that I end up having to follow him back to his village and stuff. And he turns, he turns on this street and I turn on that street and give him the eye. But, uh, isn't it hurt when you realize that you're seen (laughs) in those moments? You're like, you just shat, you just shat where you eat, you live, you know, you just shat in your own bed. Kind of humbles you a little bit. I mean, I know I've done it. I know I've done it. You've been uh, you've been rude to people. Oh, wow. <laughs> clearly, <laughs> yeah. No, I remember. It's just like sometimes I used to forget that I was like homeless and living in a van and very visible to many many people in the place that I was staying. And like, you know, I had a job, but I remember when I like flipped out on a customer, or flipped out about a customer, and they heard me. I was like, this person. <laughs> where were we, Where were you working? A fuck. Oh, I was working at a pizza restaurant. What happened? They wanted to skip the line. Look, man, everybody waits in line. Thursday's a fucking busy night, and they wanted to skip the line uh, to go straight to ordering their whole food just so that they can, you know, get their kid's pizza made first. Because it was like, you know, someone came out to the table and made the pizza with the kid. It was a really cool idea. And I was like, fuck these motherfucking people for wanting special treatment to have, like, have to go before everyone. There's only so many tables. The line was so long. It's like you can't, you start skipping people in line, and it's just a, it's an all for all. I got gotcha. it. Was, it was a violent feeding frenzy of pizza <laughs> hour. And I wasn't having it. And then I was like, these people definitely see me all the time. And I was like, ah, oh, shit, I'm seen. And I play music, and I play music about trying to be a better person. And, uh, and I was like, well, this is this is ugly. It's a bad color. And I still get that color sometimes, but it was a bad color. Well, don't you think some people deserve it? I don't like the word deserve. Well, like a confrontational kind of friendly. Who am I? A confrontational friendly check to from one human being to another is part of our like social responsibility. Friendly check is one thing. That well, wasn't so friendly. You know what I mean? <laughs> We're not talking about doing friendly checks. These are kind of like aggressive. Well, when this guy in my neighborhood came by, I said, hey, motherfucker, you better slow the fuck down or you're going to have some fucking trouble right now. I got my dog right here and if you fucking come close to running around, I'm a... and then I hesitate on like making direct physical violent threats. And oh. then basically just keep saying fuck over and over until he's like okay yeah oh sorry i didn't know that you're i mean i guess if it works like mission accomplished i saw this video the other day it was like this both people were at the wrong and like you kind of understand why one thing happened so there was like a motorcyclist that had crossed the white line but was kind of waiting to turn but past the stopping line like into kind of into the turn and an old man is turning onto the road and he nicks him and the bike goes over and the guy just runs and the old man's stopping and he's very old he's someone's like pappy (laughs) with like big bottle glasses and shit and the dude just runs up and smashes the window and scares the guy even though he stopped Uh, and it was like 
fucked. I hate it because it's like it was put online as like social justice for me getting hit on my motorcycle and I did get hurt. But I scared the shit out of this old man who stopped to clearly fess up to what he had done. I thought it was just like, come on, get your ego out of the way. Yep. That's an old man. Yep. These are the people that fucking drive me nuts. There was a biker on the trail too. That There was a disabled woman who can't hardly move. She's got some kind of terrible muscular dystrophy. Well, every time we come through with the dog, she loves the dog. And and they, they she starts screaming in delight and the dog is also very happy and they all and she always carries a little tray and she gets a little treat dog she brings dog treats and gives them to all the dogs. And, and one day we're sitting here chatting with this nice lady and uh, some guy on a bike comes up and he's like because we're like in the way and he gets all like huffy about it and I wanted to fucking kill that guy you fucking kidding me you I know f- what you mean he's like this is so inconvenient this retarded lady's right in my way like dude I will fucking what kind of piece of shit um <laughs> I might be a kind of piece of shit. I think I made a child fall off his bike the other day. (laughs) It's not funny, but it's funny because I was like, I was like, okay, so he was coming down a ramp that I had to go up to. It was a two way ramp going towards the bridge. And I saw him coming with his dad, and I was like, I'm going pretty fast. This kid's going to get nervous. So I started slowing down. I was like, I saw him get nervous. I was like, I'm going to stop before I hit this bridge. And the kid braked and overmaneuvered and went right the fuck over his handlebars, and he biffed it. And I mean, the <laughs> screaming, the crying. And I saw the dad look at me. I was like, I stopped. Like, I saw him get nervous. I stopped. And I was like, I hope he's okay. Uh, I, I'm just kidding. I didn't ask. I, I totally just wrote the fuck <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was trying to make myself look like a better person. I'm proud no, of you. No, I, I just wrote by. Huh? Yeah, I'm proud of you. I mean, dude. He's I a felt kid. shame. And I was like, I'm not carrying the shame with me all day. That kid over maneuvered <laughs> and he and braked at the same time. And he just learned a life lesson. And that's how to ride down a fucking ramp. <laughs> he's a, <laughs> look, he's a kid. You know, I mean, I felt like that not too long ago, and now I'm like, maybe I don't know what the fuck happened to my hand, but I gotta do a doctor. You know, yeah, he'll be fine. It'd be it's worse. Fine. It'd be worse if it was a senior citizen. That's just mean. But a kid, he'll be fine. Did you ever fall over your handlebars? I just imagine myself knocking over a senior. <laughs> I had, <laughs> when I was young, so my parents like had me on lockdown for like three years when I was a teenager. I got grounded three years in a row. Uh, but for one New Year's Eve, my dad made me go to the church, like church dance. He always wanted me to go to the church functions, but none of the young people came because we didn't have a young church. Uh, and it was a very sweet thing, but this like 90 year old dude wanted to dance with a young girl again. And I was dancing with him, fell. This old man fell and I was standing there. Everybody's like, oh, Sarah knocked over the old man. I was like, oh no, what do I do? I felt so bad for him. Oh man. And then I was like, oh man, I dropped the senior. (laughs) Oh my God. Okay. You gotta be, yeah, you got, they're fragile, older people. They can't scare them too much or, you know. Yeah, I used to scare the shit out of my mom, and she was furious with me. She's like, it's gonna kill me! (laughs) I was probably trying at that point. Yeah. (laughs) I Oh, every kid loves that shit to scare their mom. That's the best. It's so funny. I tried it one time. I tried it one time (laughs) to get my mom with a prank, and I thought I was being really cute, and I had maybe six ounces glass of water that, you know, you open the door... And you put the little glass on top of the door, just cracked, and then you, oh. and then I would say a curse word like "fucking shit," and you know, she would storm in the door, and like this little bit of water would come on and got on her pants, and she was like, "You're in a lot of trouble." Ah, uh, yeah. Were you in a lot of trouble though? I mean, constantly, I guess. Me too. Me too. I caught the I caught the tooth fairy with a toothbrush and uh, a bunch of marbles. I heard the tooth fairy go, "Ah oh, shit!" <laughs> tooth fairy, tooth fairy. Yeah, that's what I learned. 
I'm trying to remember. I don't know which came. It had to have been the Tooth Fairy came first and that Christmas Santa Claus came. And you beat him up too. No, my brother and I had a whole espionage thing where we had this little cassette player and uh, we would record the things that we wanted, you know, like it's talk to each other and be like, I want this, I want this, da, 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 da. and then we would go into my mom's closet and find the presents that they bought and then record what our parents bought us on this tape. And we were like, okay, so this is the thing. Santa's gonna leave us double. We already got what we want. It's gonna be the best Christmas ever. And then nothing else came. And we were like, oh shit, there's Santa. And we were like, oh shit, there's Santa. And I was like, mom, here's Santa. I wanted more presents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then we How started you- taking hostages. And then we started putting them in wood chippers. (laughs) That's it. Because that's how we handle our problems on this planet. Thank you. I know. I know. Uh, We're all, I'm working on it. So you're going to have an editing fiasco ahead of you after two hours of bullshit. No, I think it'll be good. This is actually just officially one hour 15. And it's all not... Usable. Not prosecutable. <laughs> not prosecutable in a court of law. Are you watching Get, uh, Better Call Saul? No, by any chance? no, no, no. Uh, you were saying something about lawyers earlier, and I was like, "Oh, he's watching, he's watching Better Call Saul." No, I got this. Fucking good. That's just good. All right, I'll, I'll check it out. Are you not like a TV media guy? No, I am. I'm a movie okay. and TV, and and of course I watch Breaking Bad. So, and I love. Did you Bob, not like it? I love Bob Odenkirk. Bob Odenkirk is really fucking good. He was in a, he plays this. He was in a movie Val, uh, Valentine's Day where he was trying to make up the perfect Valentine's card or something. The perfect or Girlfriend's Day. He made up a new holiday. It's a great flick. Girlfriend's Day. Yeah, yeah. Oh. But yeah, I mean, we did an hour fifteen. We can call it now, and you can come back. No, and- you can keep talking to me if you want. I don't want to keep you like on the this infinite video call. If you don't want to be here, I'm into it. If you don't want to be here. What the fuck ever. If you don't want to be here. My next appointment's in like an hour and a half. What you got going on? I'm I'm interviewing a fella that's touring with the Dead South right now in America. The Dead South End? No, it's 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 one of the most popular bands today that have like banjos in them. So it's like a hipster kind of banjo band but they're very popular and these like friends of ours who are just kind of van dwelling (laughs) weirdos are gonna be i like how i'm recording this are gonna be two i like that there's actually a banjo right next to your head while you're talking about banjo people fucking banjo people aren't they the worst (laughs) i got and violin people too they're just so stupid oh my god actually i have a friend that I'm very endeared to the banjo for his playing. It's true. Yeah. Sometimes I'm like, yep, there it is. There's the banjo. <laughs> well, tell me something. Tell me something about this uh, new album you got coming out. People don't know that you're like this awesome musician who's toured around the U.S. and you had like dates. I you t- know, you had a regular spot in New Orleans where you played every day at the Spotted Cat over twice there. a week. <laughs> you were playing every yeah, right day. 23 hours a day she was down there banging the piano and then she came to France and toured all Europe and she's just all over the place she got this great a little uh, bit going on well a lot of time to do it (laughs) got some great videos everybody check her out if you're some kind of you've been living under a rock go check her out Uh, you got a new album out called uh, High High Priestess High Priestess yeah how's it going Uh, I mean I'm fine how are you (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, let's go ahead. Sorry, that's uh, my dad joke. <laughs> um, no, the album's going good. I'm going to be finishing up this week. Uh, there's just a couple of songs. I need to do two vocal tracks and then some mixing. And it's done. And it's. How are the people that you're playing with? Are they any good? Uh, are they're they both are they... really fucking unique and incredible musicians who brought for my live show a tremendous amount to the table and i was really really grateful to be able to like put them in full trust of music i didn't know how to play live 
which was very nerve wracking for me. A lot of the new stuff is stuff I created on my computer and Lucien. And so playing it live is a lot more difficult or sometimes for me impossible. And I didn't know what I needed to, de how I needed to delegate that. That was all very, very news to me. And they came in with their loads of experience and musical knowledge and just kind of put a, spent a lot of time and hard work putting a nice support underneath what I was doing and making it sound like what I'm doing now. It's so, I have mad respect for those two guys. It's uh, Jeff, uh, Jeff Hallam and Antoine Carninon. Uh, uh, so a uh, shout out to my dudes there. <laughs> I have to tell you also, though, because I found like years and years ago, I toured with the sound guy who just did magic for me. So when I would tour in France, I was like, please get the Guillaume. Uh, and now he's also my sound guy. And he does crazy magic, him and my other technician, Adrian. And I have this dude, Benjamin, who did my light show. And I've never in my career had a light show before like this. I mean, like, OK, so he, he did my last one. But like, you know, coming to France, we started all that. And he went above and beyond. It's rumored that the people in like uh, Angers, France, the light people call him the architect. <laughs> that gives you any idea about like the sad. So anyway, the whole thing is just, I have to give the whole crew props for what they did. I hope you can see the new show. I think I'm coming to Germany. I'm coming to Germany. Well, tell Where's me, my fucking phone? tell me when we'll come. We're, we're definitely coming this It's time. a festival. So it's going to be, uh, it's like crazy travel plan. Hold on, I'm looking it up. I'm sorry, I'm wasting your time. No, well, you read out your dates. So people, that's like you're promoting yourself, getting out there. So that's going to be in July. Stuttgart Jazz Festival. Stuttgart Jazz Fest. Yeah, on the, the, the 8th of July, 2022. You know anything about it? I I actually don't, other than it's like, uh, <laughs> my manager was like, we are not taking no for an answer on this. So I was like, no, Jay, no, nothing. <laughs> okay, let's do this. God, that sounds fucking rad, dude. Uh, where's Stuttgart in orientation to you? Uh, where is Stuttgart in relation to us? Two hours south? Yeah. Yeah, two hours south, maybe. By train or car? No, either one. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But uh, no, if, if, if that's the thing. Would you? What was the date? Tell the people again the date. It's July eighth. Oh my God! Let me make sure. I'm going to cross check that. Yeah, July eighth. I'm gonna check it out. Cool. Yeah, well, God. you let me know if that's something you want to do, and I will find extra tickets. I love. Last time you came to my backyard, basically, I was just like came in my pajamas that was such a nice surprise and it was a nice show too yeah so God, was Germany, that so hit or miss so you came to darmstadt which is a is like a place where they first synthesized mdma and it's like this little sciencey really? town where they do all these experiments on where everyone does mdma where every everybody's high on mdma and they're experimenting the on monkeys <laughs> <laughs> happiest people on the planet yeah, <laughs> yeah. but uh, but the people at the show were good huh yeah, that was a really nice show. I remember that because sometimes it's hit or miss, man. Uh, man, I've had so many like really wonderful shows. Uh, I did some crazy music festivals. What's one of the worst? Last year, I would say I've. This isn't good publicity. You couldn't I say this. I can't say. You can't I say. say. No. They've all been fabulous. I can't. <laughs> I must take back my graces. I can't do that. I can't do someone that. Dirty. Oh, you could badmouth people say, in the United States. I mean, well, I don't want to do that either. Except for there were a few bartenders, excuse me, club owners in my career that promised me like two fifty for a show and handed the bartender like a check for one seventy five or two hundred and then was nowhere to be found to make it right at the end of the night. Those me, guys can suck my dick for Dude, so I worked at a venue when I was twenty and that was standard practice for most mm -hmm. of the most of the stuff. That's some bullshit. Yeah. That's some fucking bullshit. <laughs> and that happened to me so many fucking times, dude. Uh, no. Uh, incredible nah. folks. Music business, you gotta be tough. 
Yeah, well, you know, broken some D's in my career or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so what uh, any other yeah. are there date are there dates that are gonna come up after that or what, you think? I mean, yeah, I'm playing a lot in France. I have a bunch of uh I have a bunch of stuff going on in July, music festival wise. Mm. Um there's a couple of shows. I'm playing in Lyon. Um I am very unprepared for this shout out to my own tour, but it looks like the 18th of July. And that's for Festival uh, Nuit de Fourvière. You have to Google yourself to find out what is happening in your Yo, future. I try, I'm not going to lie, man. I dissociate like a motherfucker. And it brings me shame when I'm like, I don't know. Some There's some of my fans that know my fucking tour schedule better than me. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. I just have to check the fuck out because I have a process. You know? so some, I dissociate and then I do everything all at the same time, which is fucking horrible. Some French guy just comes to your door on some random day and just says, hello, we have to go. Put on your pants. I fucking wish it was that easy. My <laughs> God. No, so I live far enough to the, from the train station where I have to like um, bike to the metro with my suitcase strapped to the back and then take the metro to the train station. Oh, wow. And then whenever I come home nice and hungover, I get dumped off at my bike to strap my fucking suitcase to the back and then bike at home. <laughs> but it's fine. So has Paris been good to you, though? So you went from New Orleans to Paris. What's that like? I mean, that's crazy. Language wise, I did not know I was going to be here this long, and now I realize I was warned I would never want to leave, and it's true I'm not I'm not leaving. <laughs> so what is it about uh, the city that's got you on the on the hooks? I think I have an undeniable opportunity to be here. I mean, I I forget sometimes how beautiful Paris is just because I get wrapped up in work and the business side of whatever selling your art and soul is all about and uh you know i had one of my best friends come here and stay for me stay with me for like eight days and rediscovering how beautiful this place is and not for everything that you read about in magazines like of course like the eiffel tower is is awesome but there are details about places like this that are so old and as americans we're so unfamiliar with that shit and it's just like it'll never not be fascinating if not just because there's also like a nice arm's length different distance between usually it's nightmarish creation story and me even though we're still living in post-modernist capitalist blah 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 yeah you know, but it's, it was just, it's, it's, I, I also, I, like, I love who I am in French. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she's not so fucking stressed out because she's not looking, I'm constantly between words in French and there's just no time to be that frustrated. Do you have a French name? No, well, I have a like a dating website name, which is basically my French name because she was born of my life in France. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I can't say it here. Ah, <laughs> I don't want people just to know that, me. That, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Don't that's fire fine. Me. We, 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 we cherish that privacy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, do you like it? Like, and this is a question somebody asked me a long time ago before I was able to answer it. But it's true, like, as a person, now you're speaking German, do you feel like you have another German person? Like, is there a duality to your person? Nine. In the search for nine, okay, <laughs> well. No, of course, I mean, you take a little bit, you take a slice, but you try to be yourself at the same time, but no, of course. And it, at this okay. particular point in my life, it's actually good for me to become a little bit more German. And what it means to be German is very specific. I think to be French, it's very romantic, and to be, to be very free and romantic, and to live life, and and you know, to some degree. In Germans, it's like to cr make something and see something built and build it up and be proud of what. You yeah, think. that sounds very German. Yeah, which is is all good. Like most of the things that people aspire to do are okay, not like John Wayne Gacy or anything, but things that most people. Do. Oh. <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, 33, fucking, wow, just, anyway, he did the way he did, whatever his work was, he did it. Oh, God, are you kidding? I mean, that's not to be, like, a sarcastic, funny thing, it's just, like, yeah, you know, every, what, every epoch has their story, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, well, none of us are spared that guy. New generation. <laughs> Well, if he wouldn't have... Picked... Sorry, I'm like banana burping. Yuck. Yeah, it's okay. It's got a, it's got a nice rhythm to it. Uh, banana burp. I mean, come on. He he painted a clown. He painted clowns. He might be the most terrifying one. Uh, for me, the toy box killer. Who's that? There was this guy. The toy box killer was a the guy they found in, like, I think the early 2000s. And... A lot of the uh, murder podcasts that I listen to, they don't want to cover him because he's just a fucking disgusting fuck. But it was basically like he had this torture chamber designed for women, and he would like have this cassette that he put on their heads and made them listen to him explain what he was going to do to their bodies and record their reactions to it. And they would just violently tear them to shreds. Like the gynecological torture and t killing devices he made was just, it filled this entire like, um, one of those like pod things outside. And it was just, he had women that got away and there was just so many women that were murdered. He was hard. It was just scary. He was scary. He was so normal. Also, Isaac, uh, Elijah. Oh, what the fuck is his name? Elijah something. This dude was, had kill kits buried all over the States. I'm so sorry. I'm you burping. <laughs> what happened? I'm, I'm talking too much. Aren't I? I don't know. No, uh, that's pretty upsetting. No, go on. What, everybody, I no, wanna... they were just like the really bad serial killers that yeah. like kind of nobody really thinks of, knows about. I forget the Elijah guy for like shit. He had kill kits buried all over the United States, mm. like where he would just like go bury this kit, like dude, five years before, and then come back, take the kit, and just go kill who was closest to it, and then disappear. Weird. And how he got caught was really stupid, but he was responsible for like an enormous amount of just random murders yeah. all over the United States with kill kits. Do you know some? Anyway. Of, do you know some of the history of some of these people? Like when when did they get their wires crossed and why? Oh, that's always part of the fascination, and it's you know, childhood is really such a fragile thing. I'm a firm believer that their childhoods are usually fucked. There's always a story that you don't know. Like, there's what Ted Bundy, his family, like, oh, no, we don't know what, he was such a good kid, blah, blah, blah. That's from an era where, like, kids didn't tell if priests were touching them. Boys didn't tell if they had been touched because it was shameful, whether it was a woman or a man. You know, there was all kinds of reasons. Anything that kind of traumatic as well would be hidden. Not to say that everyone who's touched ends up a fucking Ted Bundy. No. But there's always some sort of abuse story that's very, like, violence or negligence. Yeah, yeah. But you can't tie it to a specific formula because clearly if that was the thing, there would be fucking serial killers really, really everywhere. We'd sure. all be serial killers. I have, so, I have no idea if there, there's some genetic aspect to it where somebody, you know, I my, don't know. my grandfather was a killer and his daddy before him and I'm going to kill you now. So, You know, they say most people on this planet are related to Genghis Khan. So maybe it's just a mix of like the spiciest DNA in the history of DNA and like incest. <laughs> no, no, that is a true fact about Genghis Khan. And what also is a true fact about Genghis Khan is he was one of the most... Um, he was the biggest like eco terrorist because he helped the reforestation of most of Eurasia by going around and killing people, just village to village, cutting off heads. Here we go back to the wood chipper. Uh, he was able to regrow forests and all these lands that were, you know, and, uh, they read about it. It's like, incredible that he, so you're basically saying he was population control. He was kind of like, you know, the first um, environmental activist, maybe. The first weed whacker for humans. Yeah. I mean, fuck, man. That guy killed everybody. Yeah. He, he didn't care. He didn't give a fuck. The Mongolians. How did Genghis Khan die? Do you know? I think old age. I can look it up. Oh, I think I want to look it up. Genghis Khan. Everybody out there, now is your chance to look up how Genghis Khan died. Follow along with us. Uh, 
Well, it says here, of all the enigmas surrounding the Khan's life, perhaps the most famous concerns how it ended. The traditional narrative says he died in 1227 from injuries sustained in a fall from a horse. But other sources list everything from malaria to an arrow wound in the knee. Well, isn't history fascinating, folks? Listen, listen, this is why we don't believe Bibles. Yeah. That is ambiguous as fuck. <laughs> uh, could have been. Could have been. He choked on chicken bone. Could have been. He was killed he by died. angry mob. We so wait, what was his age? Did we see? I didn't see it. What was the age in that time? Oh Jesus Christ! That was born so eleven sixty two to. So he lived about sixty years. Unbelievable. Yeah, had a good run. That's pretty long for his eight book. Well, if you see some of the land in Mongolia, you realize that it was, you know, you have to go conquer other places. There's just not, unless you want to live in a yurt in the wind. But I mean, now Mongolia is one of the wildest places where there's... People pay a lot of money to go live in yurts in the wind these days. Right, right, right. <laughs> Rich billionaires go to Mongolia to... <laughs> <laughs> oh god Sa calm down jesus save your voice but yeah <gasps> yeah yeah i'd go there i'd go to mongolia i'd ride a horse and live in a yurt in the wind and you probably suffocate yeah because your lung capacity isn't oh that's more like the mountain people right yeah, yeah. that's is all mongolia like that no no yeah, i think it's high <laughs> it's high desert but it's not that high high desert that's such a beautiful like the high desert i remember hitchhiking through the high desert for the first time ever and thinking at night oh you mean like in arizona well yeah you'd go to the high desert yeah, yeah anywhere in the west too especially you'd say well it's fine it's the desert it's really hot and tonight it'll be fine it'll cool off it'll be really nice so it's cold so it's so fucking cold it's so cold. So everybody out there... It's the coldest I've ever been, was falling asleep without enough covers in fucking Arizona. That shit was cold. Yeah. Common, yeah. common misconception, y'all. Do not uh, forget to pack a sleeping bag. Yo, we had two sleeping bags, and we zipped them into one big one, and Alyssa and I cuddled and just fucking shivered and changed cuddle positions when one part of our bodies would get too cold. It was just... And then we realized we were like at some rest stop that had like a snake like copperhead warning it's like scorpions and copperheads like warm places and i was like cool on this very cold evening we are the warmest things in a copperhead's reach sucks so i was like <laughs> afraid to touch my toes at the bottom of my sleeping bag yep it sucked i remember i woke up in the morning and my eyes were so cold that my vision was blurry they felt like tiny little marbles frozen little marbles in my head oh my god i was cold that's very, very cool. You got what doctors would describe as cold eyes. She's got cold eyes. Cold eyes. <laughs> uh, there, well, there was a thing in Mexico is that you had to keep your uh, your shoes folded over in a, such a way that a scorpion wouldn't crawl in there. Mm. But yep. I took that. That shit's get in your boot. I took that seriously. I've never seen a live scorpion in the wild, but I have seen a t tarantula. Is it is the closest you got to the tropics, New, uh, New Orleans? No, and I'm going back soon, too. So uh, there's an island off the coast of Madagascar called La Réunion. It's French territory. I know it. Okay. I'm going there. And I went there. So I went there and played a concert in... 2020 october 2020 and it went really really good it was like so much fucking fun so they invited us back two nights in a row at the outdoor amphitheater and we're going there for two weeks again girl as a whole band where you want to be it's fucking probably the dopest show i've ever been booked to play i mean it was really good when i did it alone but i'm going back with my light show and my fucking new band, it's going to be so good. Um, it's going to be so good. I'm so fucking excited. Dude, and that, that's, we, we leave on May 10th, so that's really soon. That's going to change your life. That's, that's the way. I mean, ooh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, banana cast! It's crazy, man. 
Yeah, it changed my life the last time. I mean, like when you see a bamboo forest and you see, you know, bamboo that's huggable oh, big yeah. around yeah. this wild shit. There was this tree that had thorns on it like this long. Just these big, beefy rose thorns. I was like, that is some dope ass fucking shit. So, how long are you going to be there? Uh, two weeks. We, two weeks. Like, but you have, yeah, how much get... are you going to play? Two days. They two fly days. us there a little. Yeah, dude. They fly us there. <laughs> Come on. It's like the fucking Indian Ocean. You can go walk out waist deep and like a mile out, and you just will waste deep. It's dangerous to do that because then you got to go back in the current, blah, blah, blah. It's also, it's like the barrier reef. Like on the other sides of the reef, there's like shit tons of sharks. They're like, do not go beyond the reef. People die out there all the time. I don't mess around with shit like that. No. I do not mess around with shit like that either. Fucking sharks are scary. Nope. I love sharks, but I will not fuck with sharks, yo. Respect. Respect for the sharks. Yeah. Bitey boys. Something's too spicy. Yeah. I, ah. I, was, I wrestled with manta rays. No, not oh. really. No, I was in Mexico, and I got out of the water, and they were like, there's, like, stingrays all in that water right now. I was like, oh, okay. Thanks. Yeah, these things are not nice. They, they're nasty. Yeah. Oh, that's what killed Steve uh, Irwin. Steve well, Irwin. Steve, Steve Irwin, to be fair, I love animals, and I think he kind of tortured them a bit by getting them all worked up and shit. He's, a, he's all right. He, get, he can get normal people hooked on the idea of animals and stuff, but he was kind of antagonistic. So. I think... I think I'm not objective enough of my love for Steve Irwin to be able to say I think he agitated the animals for... I think that there's a certain amount of know-how. Like, you know, you're like, okay, so if this is what happens, this is what it looks like. Right. Without... Well, for a lot of animals, for a lot of animals, it's like... uh, Human interaction is agitation. That's that, too. That, too. That's true. But what like, were you gonna say? But it's like going up to beside somebody that's at a convenience store and just like grabbing them by the collar of their shirt and dragging them outside the convenience store and saying, "Hey, look at what we got here." And he's a guy. Yeah. He's buying milk and lottery tickets. You see? Like, see his yeah. nose? See his? See his teeth? Isn't he pretty? All right, we're gonna see if we can get him to bite us. Okay, let's see. You know, I would bite. I'm a biter. Oh, <laughs> I would bite him too. I'm a fucking biter. Oh, this one's this one. He's he's a fighter. I'm a fighter and a biter. I'll fight dirty. Yeah. My fingernails are like paper thin, so they slice like paper cuts. Have you ever gotten a fist fight, like, or a, no. a scuffle? No. Nah. A struggle? I got in a scuffle, like, in a car with my teenage friends. Uh, she was always trying to get me to go be the one to ask dudes to buy a cigarettes because I had the bigger boobs. <laughs> And so she had a car full of, like, her cool senior friends with her. She's a little older than me. And uh, she stops, and she's like, go get it. Go ask this guy, Sarah. And I was like, why? I was like, uh, I was like, oh, wait, let me go get it. I wanted to go. I was like, I'll go ask the guys. And she's like, no, I'm going to go do it. And I was like, come on, my boobs are bigger. And she started to hit me. And I thought it was a joke until I realized she wasn't. And I started, I was wearing these, like, platforms, like, this big. <laughs> And so I started kicking her face into the ceiling, and it all escalated to where she put a cigarette out on my chest. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we were friends, like, immediately after that. Oh, that's uh, awesome. Yeah, no, I never said – I was just like, well, that was fucked up. Fuck you. And she's like, don't call my boobs small in front of the boys. And I was like, can you put a full-ass cigarette out on my chest, bitch? But okay. I mean, what else are high school friends? I do. It's all good. I put. I spilled. I, we. I would go to my friend's house. Three boys. We would all sit around, smoke weed, and pass the bong back and forth. I spilled the. I was so high that I passed the bong to my friend, and I just kind of poured out bong water all over his oh. lap. And then he was like, "That's that's it, man." And they got the blow dart gun. All the boys at the time had. Oh, to I had one of those. Bad idea. Needles in it. The dude shot me in the fucking knee, and I'll never forget being high out of my mind, looking at this half inch needle. Half it was like in there about a half inch, and I get, <laughs> yanked it out. I and I couldn't walk right for a week. Oh my god! Yeah, blow darts are not a joke. Just to be stoned and get shot with a blow dart gun in the knee. That was that was that was good. I threw a dart at my brother once. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a very actually traumatic memory for him. I know that it is. 
But like he was into a little shit, and I know I never did anything to him that he wasn't egging me on to do. But that's a little extreme. I hit him with a dart, <laughs> and it stuck in his arm. It was like a rusty dart. Did it, it stuck in like stiff? Yeah, it stuck in. <laughs> I'm doing like the Jim Carrey. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, oh, no, no, it's okay. And, of course, I got into trouble. It was at Grandma's house. So I think I got out a little easy because it was at Grandma's house. But my brother never let that go because I hit him with a dart. That's a dangerous thing. Dude, do you believe that anything called lawn darts even existed? And I got to play with them. I never saw a lawn dart, but they look – I still kind of want some. That looks like a great game. They would turn us kids loose in a yard that had these old rusted – it, for people that don't know, lawn darts were just darts, but they were gigantic and heavy. <laughs> and you, what they would, people would do is throw them up in the air, and they would come down oh, and shit. stick in the grass. And you would try to get points on like a thing that's stuck in the grass. Well, they you would turn us it. kids loose, like six, <laughs> six boys and two girls, all go play in the yard and either. God damn! Can you imagine me. if somebody like threw one straight up in the air and it just comes thunk? Yeah, that would be... Well, right they killed tons of kids. It's, I'm sure. I want to look up lawn dart fatalities. Sorry. I don't mean to laugh. That's terrible. I... <laughs> that's terrible. Yeah, here we go. Lawn, effective on December 19th, 1988, they banned the sale of all lawn darts in the United States and pointed lawn darts intended for the use in an outdoor game that have been responsible for the deaths of three children. Three. Well, that's enough. That could have been like a... You Was know. it the whole same household, I wonder? Because that changes the story. <laughs> it's fucked up. They were all brothers. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, well, maybe... Like, wow, that's fucked up. I gotta stop. We're talking about dead babies here. Wow, that could have been the, the dad killed him with the lawn darts. That's kind of what I was saying. Are we talking a true crime episode right yeah. now? It wasn't, it wasn't just some accident, you know? <sighs> God. And then you got Jeffrey Dahmer, who actually ate people and put them, put the heads and stuff in a freezer in his apartment. And all the neighbors said, yeah, he was a nice guy, but uh, quiet. He charmed the cop into giving him the, the, the young boy back, the 14-year-old kid back. Oh, really? Because it was the one that got away. And he went to a cop. He was all fucked up. And he was like, no, no, no. I'm sorry, he got out. And the cop was like, are you sure you can take care of him? He's like, don't worry, I'm taking good care of him. The cop leaves, and he took him down to the basement and killed him. And why hasn't there been a movie about that? That's grotesque. I'm pretty sure there has been. Ugh. I mean, I don't think you need a movie about it necessarily. I don't know. Too dark? They did the Ted Bundy one. I don't know. That was pretty dark. The, the fucking... Uh, Family impact statements at that trial were very sad. Just very sad. There was only one B movie made about him. Nothing substantial. No big Hollywood blockbuster. Zodiac Did they kill him in jail? Yes, I haven't watched the Zodiac one yet. I uh I can't believe they didn't catch him. Yeah. Didn't they know who, think they knew who he was, though? I kind of don't know anything about it, to they, be honest. Well, they have lots of theories. They thought it was actually another guy that got arrested later who thought it might have been him as well. But I don't know. No, they didn't catch Some him. Some people think it's the guy that disappeared out of the plane. You know what I'm talking about? No, who? It was like apparently some guy that just like straight up disappeared out of a plane. He jumped, uh, jumped out of it. They don't know, but he was like never found. I like. I don't know the full story, but it was like some sort of like crazy espionage shit where this man straight up definitely lived but disappeared. Yeah. Uh, and they think it was him, but I don't think. I think it's been debunked. I love the stories where people that like that. W- when they try to get away or they get away for a long time, where do they go and what kind of life do they lead at that point? The Alcatraz guys? Yo, I'm not even mad. Like, I would I would do anything to know what those Alcatraz dudes did with the rest of their life. So they basically got out of Alcatraz. They broke out of Alcatraz using a raft made of their own clothes that they made, like, inflatable. 
And I saw the made-for-TV movie when I was a kid, and I was like, this oh, is God. awesome. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I remember watching several specials on them and being like, interesting. Respect. Yeah, kind of, because you're like, you kind of, in the end, it's one of those stories where you root for them. Yeah, the yeah. guys that got away from the impermeable prison. Yeah, yeah. There is a great flick that just came out starring the kid that played Harry Potter, and he's trying to, he breaks out of a South African prison. And during apartheid, because he was like an activist, and it's based on a true story, that he was an activist for, against apartheid, and he got locked up for, you know, whatever. They locked him up for a fucking long time, and they broke out. They made some like wooden keys and shit. You got to see the flick. It's good. Everybody out there, too, check it out. It's called uh, uh, Pretoria, because that's where it took, take, takes place. But... Uh, I couple of friends who've been in a another country when there's been a coup really yeah my manager my management my management team if i'm not mistaken i don't remember where they all had to get the fuck out of a place because there was like a coup Ooh. uh and then i i met this guy when i first started coming here he's a videographer shame on me for not remembering his name he was a very nice man. Uh, he had gone down to the Congo to do some sort of like filming documentary. I don't really remember why he was there. But while he was in the hotel, there was like a change in government. Like it just, and something went wrong and then they would not let them out of the hotel. Like whatsoever, the hotel was guarded by guys with guns and all kinds of shit. And they were like, you are not allowed to leave. Like you cannot. And uh, someone came, like a phone call came in and was like, you need to be at the back door at this time. And they ended up, I think, ditching a lot of their equipment. And they went to the back door and were smuggled away through the jungle at night. Uh, and like, they didn't know where they were going. Nobody was really telling them where they were going. And he said they came to this clearing where there was a fucking airplane. And they were like, this airplane is getting you the fuck out of here. And so they got into it. And once they were in the air, they realized they were in the fucking presidential airplane. The toilet was made of gold. And he was like, what the fuck is happening? And they're like, "This, we're using this to take people the fuck out of, out of here. And it was just like this crazy fucking thing where all of a sudden he was just like in the president's plane with the gold toilet fleeing the country. Because it was like, you know, Somebody had to get him the fuck out of there. That's crazy. I love that. And all of a sudden, yeah, everything that was uh, used to be the law and used to, uh, it's out the window. Done. I mean, the fucking and the CIA. I've I've been obsessed with the CIA and their intervention with other people's politics forever. It's really kind of crazy. You, it all sounds like fake shit, but they literally released the documents of the crazy shit they did to manipulate the world. Yeah. The one of the most stunning is the ones that people say, that didn't happen or whatever. It fucking most certainly did happen. They used to, in the, in the 60s, the CIA set up the MK Ultra and also had a subsection of this MK Ultra experiment called Operation Midnight Climax, where they would lead uh, unsuspecting uh, customers of prostitutes called Johns to um, brothels operated by the CIA where they would give the, the people all kinds of different uh, psychoactive substances including LSD and then watch these people trip out on it, have sex with the girls and the prostitutes were on the payroll of the CIA at the time and they watched what happened with the Johns and through two way mirrors they would like totally record the behavior of these people on that drug and try to get information out of them or, you know, whatever at that time. That shit happened. And the CIA yeah. did it. And they and they used American taxpayer money to do it. That's an incredible piece of history. Whether, whether or not you're, like, big on anything, that's what mm -hmm. the CIA says is true. That's incredible. That's fucking... I read one recently where they like released a uh, a vampire scheme of like d people getting killed by vampires in the Philippines to like scare people away from revolting or some shit like that. Wow. And they got people to believe that there was a vampire attack happening in this small village or some shit. 
I mean, that's yeah. some crazy shit. Like, of course, um, like psychological warfare. Right. You know, we talk biological and like you know whatever, but fucking psychological warfare. Going after so the cool. mind. Well, and yeah, they, dude. they also in the '90s when there was all this popularity with the X Files and UFOs came about and people started seeing UFOs and everything. It came out that the CIA was leaking documents that was. Um, they leaked documents that showed that they were purposefully spreading this information about un, you know aliens and UFOs to try to just take the the credit away from like any experimental aircraft that they were working on at that time, just as like a, a ruse. But it, I think it had you know you have Roswell and everything. This is probably all based on some kind of CIA manufactured mythology. I would believe that. I would believe it. I mean, like, oh, God, what happens when you get politically gaslit your entire life is nothing is unbelievable and literally nothing is believable. You know, don't buy any of the bullshit, but it's all believable. You know? <laughs> God. And this is where we're at. Yep. Um, may I get another quick pee break? Yeah, let's. <laughs> so anyway everybody check out uh, her tour schedule sarah mccoy uh, she's going to be performing all over europe you you make an attempt to check her music out buy the album download it stream it where streaming is available you know i have a new single coming out at the end of june there you go check her music called out. just because and it's different it's something different Not, okay. listen to her stuff and then tell a friend because it's good music from good people who have good stories not just like pop uh, garbage you know it's good stuff i'm i mean pop i might be pop i'm just <laughs> i might be pop garbage now i don't know no kind you're of a fine. pop album no okay. you're fine yeah, and you're going to be a superstar. The more you, the more you practice. But we're going to save that voice. Save the voice. Got it. Save it. Don't scream at too many people. Don't give them. Tell them to fuck, fuck, drop, drop. No dealing out my justice and revenges. No, you call me. I'll do it. I'll put them in the wood chipper. Get out the fucking wood chipper, bro. <laughs> Is that where we're going right now? You going to put me in the wood chipper? That's going to be the name of this episode with the wood chipper. <laughs> Shipper, please. <laughs> Perfect. Well, wave goodbye. Perfect. Wave goodbye to the people in TV land. Bye, bye, TV lands. Hope you uh, hope you enjoyed my potato head. <laughs> <laughs> I potatoed. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. All right, bye. <laughs>